You guys look like... What do they look like, Jimmy? Dorks. <laughs> they look like a couple of dorks. Get those nerds! 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 They're coming to get you, Barbara. What are you kidding? We got us a family here. Can you dig it? Can you dig it? Can you dig it? You are listening to the In the Mouth of Dorkness podcast. Here are Brad, Lisa, Brian, and Darren. Welcome to another edition of the It Modcast podcast. Joining us is Brian Young. God, I love being a turtle! The Turtle Dork. So, from our family to yours, keep your pants dry, your dreams wet, and remember, hugs, not drugs. And also joining us is Lisa Gullickson. Quick, suck it before the venom reaches my heart. Wife Dork. Only best buddies execute pedophiles together. And... Brad Gullickson. And for gosh sake, watch your language. That's not going away anytime soon. Mouth door. Get out of my way, son. You're using my oxygen. <laughs> and I'm your host, Darren Smith. Warm. Warmer. Disco. The Disco Door. I was born into war. Bred into it. People think they understand pain, but they have no concept of it. What's the most pain you've ever felt? Maybe the kind that leaves you more machine than man. And welcome to the It Modcast podcast. Yay! Yay Lisa, don't laugh at my Jack Nicholson. It was spot on. Oh, I, I just like that you had like this like complimentary hand gesture that was just for those of us in the room. <laughs> yep. Yep. You I was trying get, to do the you gotta, eyes. You gotta get in the character. Yeah. yeah. You know? yeah. And the character is scrunchy, scrunchy fingers. <laughs> I appreciate it. Uh, hi, howdy, dorks, fellow dorks. How's everyone doing? Woo! Glad to be uh, back in the door cave. I'm glad you all survived another week. Uh, let me do this before we jump into our weeks in dork. Um, if you are a listener of the podcast, new or old, and you have not yet left a review on the In the Mouth of Dorkness page on iTunes. You're a real piece of shit. I wasn't going to say that. Oh. Okay. But I was going to imply it gently <laughs> and poetically. I, I wasn't going to imply it either. I was just going to ask if you would be so kind uh, to go ahead and just drop by and leave a, a comment. Rate this, rate this show and also subscribe if you haven't. Uh, it really helps us get new listeners to Apple Podcasts. Please, please. Five stars only. Mm -hmm. Plus, it makes us feel good. It turns out words of affirmation are our love language. Yay. Brian? Yes. <laughs> All right. And so that's also why, ladies and gentlemen, because yes. <laughs> uh, we'll, Five we're gonna, stars. We're gonna Five stars. Re we'll read you. I, before I was a member of the Dork Cave, I myself wrote a review, gave this show five stars. So... It can happen to you. You're the first review on uh, Apple Podcasts. Yeah, it's like, this show is so great, I'm getting on it. And then it happened. <laughs> See? So, uh, yeah. Just and like... now the show's even better. That's a fact. That's true. Yes, it is. Uh, so, Words uh, of affirmation. Give us a review language. and or a comment, and uh, we'll read it on five stars only, the, please. the next episode, and uh, we'll shout you out and say thank you again. No less than five, even for humor. Yes. Rick? Yes, uh, please. And so, uh, now... With that business out of the way, Brian. Yes. How was your week in Dork? So I, um, I I watch a lot of trailers. Um, so I do a lot of trailer reactions. So the one I want to talk about, well, a few I want to talk about. First is uh, Black Klansman. This is the new film from Spike Lee, and uh, actually let me pull it up here. This is from Spike Lee, and it's coming out later this year in August. And it was just premiered at the Cannes Film Festival. We got it got great reviews. It got a standing ovation. Um, and I think recently uh, the the judges they finally um, had their awards. And I know it won one of the big awards. I don't know if it won the the Palme d'Or, uh, but it won one of the big awards coming out of Cannes Film Festival. But um, I need to do a better job of giving a shit about the Cannes Film Festival. Yeah, you're right. You're absolutely right. <laughs> me, me too. Me too. Because I, I, I really don't care much about that. I, you know, just before you get onto your own reaction, mm -hmm. I thought it was interesting uh, about this particular screening. You know, it had a massive yeah. uh, ovation, as you were saying, 
uh, but out of the critics who were there, there was only two African American critics. Yeah, I read about that. And you know, it was uh, Jacqueline Coley from Rotten Tomatoes, and oh gosh, uh, Miriam Bale from uh, W Magazine. Okay. And both of them did not seem to have the same response. So, yeah. That the crowd did. Yeah, which so is I'm fascinating. Which is interesting. I, I read I read something about that on Twitter mm-hmm. as well, and I found that to be interesting as well. But you, I'm, I, like, did you read Bale's? article in no. w magazine i'm gonna send it to you okay. i'd like to get your point of view on okay it too. okay yeah so uh after that screening they dropped a trailer and we heard about this film with uh jordan peele producing and spike lee directing um denzel washington's son john david washington and of course adam driver who was really on a hot streak um i thought the trailer was uh f- fascinating i thought it was fantastic um i wasn't expecting that kind of tone to come out of it not i don't want to call it a comedic tone but it definitely has a tone that i feel it kind of evokes a little bit of Tar- tarantino-esque um a little kind of inglorious bastards type of feel to it um uh, which it's i find to be i mean i think there are straight up comic sight gags in there the trailer. Is, there, there is. There, there, there is. There are a lot of those. Um, I, I didn't know Topher Grace was in there playing David Duke. I find that to be um, an in- interesting casting, but <laughs> it, it could be inspired casting, but I'm, I'm going to hold my reservations on that. But I thought it was fascinating. But interesting, the one thing I do want to point out is like... Uh, I feel I have a badge of honor now on YouTube because uh, I have like a negative comment, kind of a troll. It, it was in my spam, so I don't know if this is an actual real uh, person or not. Oh my god! But uh, I, I, when I read it, it just it actually brought joy to me. Read it. Is it a read racist it. robot? Uh, no, not really. But Russian. just you know, basically complaining about you know how we're we're not over slavery. We need to get past it and all this oh, stuff. God. But uh, it's it's great. Uh, let's see. So uh, just just what we need, another movie to help racially divide the crumbling country even more. Oh, goody. Instead of boohooing about something that ended 148 years ago, why don't you forge ahead and make a statement about you, about your can't even spell, you accomplishments? No one alive right now has owned a slave or been a slave. Your whining is getting old. You're not the only group that's ever been persecuted. You're just the only group that uses it to scam the system and uh-huh. made oh, an art form. <laughs> and made an art form of it uh, for generations. Native Americans. Irish, Italians, Jews have been persecuted for their beliefs. Religion seems to be the latest group targeted. Why not and work together instead of being negative and selfish? And I was like, oh, man. Gross. <laughs> yeah. But, hey, it's like, you know, you know, we got we to stoke some fire there. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. So, I don't know. Like I said, but not going to give too much satisfaction to this review. But, you know. Don't, I, did, we haven't said his name, right? No. Yeah, no, don't no, give no, him, no. Don't give but I do want to give shout out to all of our subscribers that leave great comments and that, you know, really like to just kind of uh, – further the conversation so i do appreciate a lot of that but uh yeah i mean i like the fact that this movie is sparking this kind of anger amongst people uh because that's what spike lee does yeah <laughs> and i'm looking forward to this film yeah. um the next one is bohemian rhapsody i really enjoyed that trailer um I can't say I've been a massive fan of Queen, but watching that trailer and you hear like the medley of all like their hits, um, they do have that stadium rock anthems that they that they have that people love. And I think whether you're a Queen fan or not, everybody has heard some of their music. Of course, as you've seen Wayne's World, uh, you have. And I like the way that this trailer kind of builds on like like showcasing their music um, and then to see Rami Malek and when you hear him speak and you know everything about Freddie Mercury um, well I don't really know much about him but he really does feel like he's tapping into something that could you know get some it, it is surreal to to see Malik in the role because he looks like Malik, yeah. but then he's got the Freddie Mercury teeth and yeah, mustache. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like, this is odd. And it's interesting because uh, Sasha Baron Cohen was originally supposed right. to play uh, uh, Freddie I, Mercury. I think that that would be fascinating. I think that Rami Malik, yeah. as as interesting looking as he is, is yeah. kind of a less interesting choice. And I and I'm kind of wondering, like, what's the story behind? I remember being super excited when Sasha Baron Cohen got announced. Yeah, Freddie yeah. Mercury, and, and doubly disappointed when it it fell through. It was a uh, creative differences, like mm-hmm. where Sasha wanted to take that character. What he was doing was well. Not I think you know the film is uh, ma- has been made with. 
participation with the band Queen. Yeah. So I think, it, and you know, they need that music. They need, you know, yeah. We Will Rock You. They need, mm-hmm. uh, you know, Another One Bites the Dust. Yeah. And so it might be a little more favorable of a film than what Sasha, Sasha Baron Cohen wanted. And I think it's probably going to focus more on the band than it is on Freddie Mercury. Yeah, I'm curious. I don't know. Like, uh, yeah. I, I'm. I, I watched that trailer. I don't think I was as enthused as you were. I am curious. Yeah, it just caught me by surprise. Yeah. I'm, I'm more interested in the behind-the-scenes insanity of the film with Brian Singer having to That's go true. away yeah, yeah, yeah. and Dexter Fletcher coming on in to finish the film. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so I don't know. We'll Interesting. see. Yeah, yeah. So just a couple more. Um, Can I have an, uh, about that trailer, one last thing. I saw it on my phone Initially, or yeah, on a small screen. Yeah. Today, when I went to uh, see Deadpool two, they played it on the big screen, mm. and I was in the prime auditorium. And those those songs, oh, yeah. their legacy. Yeah. It was epic. That's a movie you want to see in Dolby Prime. Yeah. yeah. It was epic in there, yeah. and it just like you, it, it just made me realize, like, damn, these people. Not only did they have like a bunch of hits, but they were like a huge part of my childhood because yeah. like everything I remember. About those songs come from there's this it's tinged in nostalgia. Uh, Flash of, Gordon, when I was, when I was kid, Princes yeah. of the Universe, Highlander, like, yeah. Whew, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's crazy. Like I said, I haven't, I was never like a massive Queen fan, but you know their music, and I think that's just I, so. I think that's really going to bring. And when this movie comes out, their music is going to skyrocket. Like it's going to be crazy how many downloads and everything that, that uh, their albums are going to get. And uh, just a couple more um, trailers that I reacted to. The next one was Mile Twenty Two. This is the new film by Peter Berg. I was interested in this movie because I, I, I like the ca- well. Him and Mark Wahlberg work together a lot. This is the first time that uh, we're going to get um, a lot to see a lot more of Eco Uwas. We've seen him in a lot of foreign films, but now he's actually going to be in a big budget Hollywood production, uh, which is going to kind of introduce him more so to mainstream audiences which I'm kind of excited about I'm just really hoping that uh, that Peter Berg uses him, utilizes his skills uh, in a positive way uh, we've seen how that has happened with a lot of international Asian stars before with Jackie Chan, Jet Li, Donnie Yen even um, and they just really haven't been able to kind of maximize uh, what they're good at. I think so. Jackie Chan's had some really yeah, no, ja- great Jackie American Chan, films. But I'm really thinking more so like Donnie Yen. When you see him in like yeah. Blade 2 or Shanghai Nights, yeah. um, I was like, come on, man. Like yeah. You're going to introduce this guy. Like, come on. Like, show what Donnie I mean, Yen can really do. Is Donnie Yen's best American movie Rogue One? I don't know. Mm. I mean, Blade Two is a better movie, but yeah, his, yeah, yeah. his character of the as, Snowman is a big disappointment. Yeah, that. yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I hope that Eco because people love that guy. People yeah. love that dude, and I really want to kind of introduce. Like, I just, I really hope um, the world can embrace him in a big Hollywood production. So that's really what gets me excited about that film and Lauren Cohen from The Walking Dead. It's interesting to see her in something new and something different, so I'm, I'm interested to see how that casting is going to play out. Um, the last one is The Happy Time Murders. <laughs> yeah. Oh, God. My Lord. <laughs> oh, your reaction, man. <laughs> if you have not seen Brian's reaction to The Happy Time Murders trailer, you've got to click on YouTube ASAP. <laughs> yes. I knew about this movie from, like, last year while this was in production. I knew Brian Henson, the son of Jim Henson, was directing this film. Um, and that Melissa McCarthy was in, and that was going to be like this R-rated kind of crude, this crude humor film um, that was going to be kind of like a comedy crime story, whatnot. But um, so I was excited to see this trailer, and uh, I knew when I said it was a Red Band trailer, I was like, okay, uh, this is going to be something to look. I mean, when you start your marketing campaign with a Red Band trailer, that's making a statement. But man, the end of that trailer was. Man, I, I don't. <laughs> I don't think anybody was ready for that. I, I, I really don't. I, I was not expecting them to go, <laughs> to did, go. To did go you guys there. have it in your Deadpool two screen? No, I didn't. I see did. It. Neither did I. Yeah, I, I, did. Didn't, I didn't. I didn't see it in the Deadpool. I'd love two. to have seen it with a crowd. It killed both times. Like yeah. it killed. Oh my goodness. Like even like you know the 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 trailer ends, then it t- it shows the title screen. You know, the audio cuts out. Like people were still laughing like hard. At that shit. Yeah. 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 And even some of the bits with Melissa McCarthy. And I haven't, like, she's been hit or miss for me a lot. I'm not that big of a fan. But when she gets into the right material, it can, it can, really, it can really hit uh, at a high level. And I'm, I'm hoping this will be that for her. 
So uh, I, I'm looking forward to it. I, I can't wait for the Happy Time Murders. This Man, I did like when they're shooting the when they're shooting the puppets with this shotgun and their heads are exploding. Oh yeah, <laughs> it's just like cotton and shit. Lisa, how do you feel about the Happy Time Murders? I don't approve. <laughs> oh. I don't approve. As like, so I didn't initially watch the trailer. I watched your trailer reaction, okay. so I haven't really seen the trailer. <laughs> yeah. But Brad, to my disgust. <laughs> Kind of narrated it to me, and um, and I, I had to write it up for FSR. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. and I so I got to like I got to help. I got to read that. I and kept playing the last sequence <laughs> over and over and over again. To me, I just like you know I don't know like I, I it's because I was like I was raised by the Muppets, and so to me yeah. like the Muppets are like a sacred thing, and I know that that's what they're playing on, and yeah. I would love to be like a super cool person who's like, yeah, Muppet Jizz is so funny, <laughs> but I just can't like I'm just like I don't like it like I think it all goes back to if I could lay down on this couch, I think it goes back to um uh what meet the feebles. No, I didn't see Meet the Feebles. Yeah. Uh, uh, Avenue Q? No, I, I kind of like Avenue Q. Hmm. I know. Because I've never seen it. I just really like the music. Oh, no, we saw no, it. We saw it, yeah. We saw, we it, saw it at the Warner Theater. Yeah. No, I'm thinking of... I'm blanking the on his theater, name. Actually. Talk show host, red hair. Uh, Conan very O'Brien. tall. Yeah, Conan O'Brien. Uh. On his first talk show, he had a character called yeah. Vomiting Kermit. Yeah, I remember. And it was fucking traumatic to me. So now I'm just like, I can't take any kind of like yeah. playing on. And I don't know. And I know that this is going to be super vomity because puppets vomiting is hilarious. I don't find it so. Uh, but I, I don't know. To me. I'm going to watch it. Like, I, also, like, I, like, I've never been into gross out humor anyway yeah. or, or sho- like that kind of shocking humor. So, like, I remember there was like one like episode of the Tenacious D yeah. TV show where mm. like someone was like jizzing all over the place and it was like hilarious to toothpaste like jizz or maybe this was a dream sequence i had yeah. but i was horrified <laughs> i was horrified I, I don't know i'm i'm a big time prude i think you know uh big time prude stepping off your own uh therapy couch looking at brian henson sitting down onto his therapy I think couch that that's fascinating and i and i know that like sometimes you have to like you know, kill your sacred calves or whatever. Is that a saying? I just invented Cows? It. I don't know about their calves. Yeah, don't get them kill their young, young, man. Go back in time Veal. to before they come become sacred and kill them before they do. Jeez. Now, um, okay, Cable. <laughs> um, yeah, I, and I understand that. Like, the fact that he can't get out. Like, you, he, you can't get out from under the Henson name. Well, the thing, but the, what's interesting about Brian Henson is my favorite Muppet movie is directed by him. Muppet Christmas Carol. That's the it's best great, Muppet movie. But, you know, like Muppet Treasure Island. Is that yeah, one also he, him? he did that. And he did, uh, you know, Muppets Tonight. And they and they, they parade all those titles at the f- start of the trailer. And this is him going like, look, my entire career, my entire life has been Muppets. Yeah. I need to exercise some chi- demons. His entire childhood was yeah. Muppets as well. Yeah. It's interesting because Disney bought the Muppets, but right. they didn't buy the Henson Company. Right. So that's why they have this movie, but there aren't any like Muppet I'm characters. glad. I would well, not want to see any actual Muppets in there. Yeah. But agreed. it's interesting for Disney because I wonder how they feel about this film. Well, that so only... at CinemaCon, yeah. when they showed this trailer, it originally had Muppets music in it uh-huh. at the start and i'm guessing disney was like "Uh, no (laughs) i wonder if disney is regretting not buying the whole henson company now well i mean i don't i don't think i mean it's not like this has never been done before yeah yeah you know and then it could probably all be put under the umbrella of like parody don't you think oh it's that's exactly what it is yeah yeah Yeah. yeah. so so interesting but relax lisa i can't i can't you don't have to watch it i'll watch it darren will watch it i but yeah i like Melissa McCarthy. Yeah. yeah. I, and, I like her as Suki in Gilmore Girls. And we'll do a review cast, and you can just sit it out on protest. I will. <laughs> I will. As long as, if it's VF, I'll watch it. Yeah. You know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. But that's my week. That's my weekend dork. Yay. <laughs> All right, wife dork, how was your week in dork? My week in work was oh. insane, and I had so much to do this week. I think that this, this is becoming a trend. I need to work less hard. Mm-hmm. I need to dork harder. Mm-hmm. Um... But I did finish Evil Genius. Have you watched Evil Genius? Yes. Oh, my God. Yes. 
Oh my god. Nice. Yeah, no, I'm sorry. Okay, not you yet. haven't watched it yet. Not yet, not yet. I think it would be fun to do a review cast of it. But like that's actually, I, yeah, I have a lot to say. Because there's it, a lot to unpack there. Yeah. Like uh, Brad and I, after I finished it, um, and we had an argument. We ha- we got in an argument. Oh, we were sitting on that couch, be- getting upset oh. about this. I'm like, ah. maybe we don't want to do a review. <laughs> <cast."> <laughs> no, that that doesn't that make good podcasting. Yeah, makes yeah. for good evidence in court. There's the audio, <laughs> Your Honor, from the exchange that happened between the. <laughs> It wasn't like a you know a fight. It was just we were on opposing Opposed viewpoints. Of yeah. yeah. What so what exactly happens in this case, which we can't talk about because Brian hasn't know. seen. That's it your yet. penance for not watching it. Be Sorry. we're going to talk about it right now. No. Uh, Review no. cast go. <laughs> I guess I can't see anything more about it, but I, but I really um, found it fascinating. I found it creepy. Like I was creeped out by it. Just that woman's voice. Just. Banging into my brain, so abrasive and so manic and insistent, like just a horrible sound. So, so I'm glad that I watched that. So, um, but then to cleanse my palate, I watched a super fun documentary called Perfect Bid, yeah. the contestant who knew too much. So, um, what this, so it's a documentary about um, The Price is Right. And this guy who kind of beat the game in a magnanimous way. So um, so the price is right. The way it used to work is people would, like on Monday, they would do their taping and people would line up and they would kind of perform for the people who would pick who gets to go onto the show. And um, then from there, the people get to go on the show and, and they talk with Bob Barker. And it was like a super easy show to shoot because it was an hour show and Bob Barker was a professional and they shot it in an hour. And the fans were super sweet and in and out. And there was very rarely any kind of problems with this system. And people started to make a real like religion of it of going and getting their you know i want to kiss holly t-shirt or um bob barker is my homeboy and then you know hoping to get on the show and they would just go every single week well there was this one guy um he was a math teacher by uh the name of theodore slosson and when he was he was like in his like early 20s i feel like Mm -hmm. He started becoming obsessed with this show and he would watch it, you know, in the morning. Like it was like really part of his routine and he managed to get like pretty nerdy about it. So he, so a lot of the same products would pop up again and again and again. So slowly he would start memorizing what the prices are and play along at home. And he was one of those like super faithful people who would go and sit in line and um, hope to get on the show. So, um, and part of the show is encouraging the audience to help by yelling out prices. And um, so he would yell out prices and he would get like really agitated, it seems to me, when people would not take his prices because his prices were super specific and correct. Mm. And so um, one day... Like, this, like, section that was sitting around Theodore Slauson discovered, like, oh, my God, this guy knows his shit. And um, and so people started listening to him, and it started to change the whole direction of the show. And then Bob Barker, being a showman, kind of turned the show around to make it about Theodore, who is this Theodore character who knows all of the answers, you know? It, you know, and everybody is checking in with Theodore, and he was on the screen. And yeah, it so was- because of him... Multiple people would win the yeah, game. Yeah, and he, and he had this kind of like you voice. know fifteen minutes of fame thing. Interesting. Okay. Later, he did in fact get on the show, and um, you know he and he did really well. But then it came down to the big spin to win thing, and you know that's really just a game of chance. And he you know got out at that point, and and once you've been on the Price is Right, you can't be on again. But he still continued to go. And so this this goes on clear through to when Bob Barker retires. And then um, Drew Carey is brought on. And, um, and, the, and also the producer of the Bob Barker era leaves as well. Right. And 
Um, and a or new, is fired. Yeah, and he, <laughs> to much to his disappointment, and a new producer is brought on. And so, uh, so th- it happens again that the people who are playing realize, oh my god, this theater Theodore guy um, seems to know his shit. So they start like obviously looking at him, like to get answers. And um, and this one guy with the last name of I think like Nice or Nice, yeah, um, manages to win the big the big prize the at showcase the, the showcase following this guy's lead. And Drew Carey's like, oh the my god, exact dollar the, value. to the exact dollar because you know it's like one of those it's a showcase, so he has to know the prices of everything in the showcase and then add it together. Mm-hmm. And both players were looking at him, but one of them was like a trip, trips, and trips are harder. Yeah. He was like sharing his whole strategy. Trips are harder to kind of like get. So, so it gets to the point where they have to. They Drew Carey is like, well, this show is now canceled. Like we can't afford to give away this showcase. Yeah. <laughs> you know, both showcases, and um, and it's just like this big time chaos. Wait, uh, so both of them got it right? So they both won? No, one guy won, but if you get it exactly, you get both showcases. Oh. And what I love about this documentary is it just goes to show that even the price of Price is Right was not taking its fans seriously. Or its game seriously. Exactly. So they they were under this false assumption that nobody would take the time to crack the game. Nobody would take the time to learn all of these prices and become super obsessed. So because of this guy, a lot of the like a lot of the old systems that made prices right, like such like a beautiful and fun thing, have had to go away. Like, Dang. oh well we can't we have to really do more research into what our items are. We can't just reuse items. You know, we have to we can't just have people line up the way that we used to. So like because they didn't anticipate like somebody really nerding out and having this and just total generosity of spirit. Like he, like um, Theodore wasn't asking anything of these people he was helping and he carries no bitterness towards the people who won both showcases because of what he did. Hmm. You know, he, he was more bitter about the people who would ignore his perfect suggestions. Yeah. So uh, like, I think that just goes to show that like, you know, whatever the art form is, whether it's a comic book or a TV show or or a game show, which is like the lowest form of entertainment. Can we agree? Yes, we do. <laughs> um, like even a game show, people become like you can't underestimate the power of being a super big time nerd. Yeah. And, and and what and and what that could mean for your show. He didn't get in trouble for any of that, did he? No, nobody okay, got good. in trouble. Okay, good. But it did like it did scare Drew like they had like a clip from um Drew Carey going on the Kevin Pollock chat show and he kept on calling Theodore Slauson, like a Rain Man character, which I thought was kind of insensitive because, you know, Rain Man is on the autism spectrum and it's not fair to just diagnose people you don't know. Yeah. Like, to me, I think it's just like he's a super snar- smart dude and, you know, he is super passionate about about your show. So, like, you should be flattered, I think, yeah. that that someone can come on and, and really be passionate about this art that you're making you know the price is right is um just a legacy show and um and yeah and and you know they should be flattered that somebody would pay such close attention to it but i also i just like the celebration of nerdosity at all you'd be shocked how much like you know he of course has collected like all of his fun posters and and t-shirts and stuff of like all his time is the on the Price is Right, but he also has like merch, like you know he has like an on like like a '90s online computer game where you can like practice guessing prices and stuff like that. And yeah. he had all of that stuff. He was just like he's a big he, fanboy. He's just a fanboy. He's, like, he's a dork. Yeah, yeah. So it's a super fun, fun watch, and and um, I don't think Drew Carey comes off looking co- totally awesome. No, but um. <laughs> Bob Barker seems pretty Bob cool. Bob Barker, yeah. He like he like if anybody really understood what the price is right was all about, it was Bob Barker. Yeah. He loved 
the fans. He loved the interactions that he had. He's like one of those showbiz people who is like, I have the easiest job, you know, and, and he and he really is soups passionate about spaying and neutering your pets. He's just like, Drew Carey better say it. I forgot to remind him. Oh, he did say it. That's good. Mm-hmm. You know, and, like he's just like he really understood what the game show was about. And and um, yeah. And I think that, you know, the price is right. If you can't afford to give away both showcases, then don't have a loophole where right. somebody can. That was a show I have seen hundreds of episodes. Yeah, Same. Brad is Brad. <laughs> but he's the like the opposite of a fanboy where he learned nothing. I learned nothing. Uh, it's 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 that was a show I watched in college before my afternoon classes. I would watch every day wow. and then go to class. What was your favorite game? Uh, Plinko. Plinko. <laughs> <laughs> yes. To me, like, The Price is Right was like a sick day yeah. thing in elementary school. Like, you're home, you're home sick in elementary school. You yeah. have conjunctivitis yeah. or whatever, yeah. and you watch The Price is Right. I like the one with the yodeling and the... Oh, yeah. What's that called? Yeah, the Mountain Climber great... one. The Mountain Climber yeah, one. Yeah, great, I don't know what that one's game. called. <laughs> I just... It's, it's a fun game. Yeah. Yeah. But and the guy's a math teacher. He should be able to do the math. Hey, yeah. I'm, I'm pro that guy. Yeah, so I'm pro yeah. teachers. Yeah. Is Bob Parker still alive? No. No. Mm. Way to end it on a down note. I'm sorry, I didn't Damn, know. I was, just he, thinking, I was just thinking. But he, sure. uh, he, in my heart, he is now the patron saint of game shows mm-hmm. and mean, spaying I've and neutering your pets. Felt that way. He is without a doubt my favorite game show host. Screw you, Alex Trebek. Alex, wow. Damn. Oh, I, I, I like Alex Trebek too. <laughs> I like. I don't know. Like to me, like, like Bob Jack Barker. Can go screw though. Oh. Pre, pre, Damn. Pre or post mustache. Alex, uh, Alex Trebek. Uh, post mustache? I don't. I'm not crazy about him. <laughs> <laughs> I like the mustache. Yeah. yeah to me, too. like don't change Trebek. <laughs> there's something about Trebek that makes he like he looks trapped to me. Damn. Like, <laughs> like Bob Barker always looked so joyful to be there, and he was like always chummy. I yeah, think Trebek's like, like, ugh, these idiots. <laughs> I think that you know, being like Jeopardy is like, like the dignified game show and I think he had to keep some pro- professional distance from mm. the thing and he's just not as warm Pat Sajak he has the cold dead eyes of a killer damn yeah, I, I, he, yeah. He, there's something yeah. there's something um, unpredictable about him yeah, there's yeah. there's dudes in his basement is he still with us yeah he's still around yeah, okay I don't know that him and that Vanna White relationship something feels a little so, awkward something's inky <laughs> inky <laughs> inky yeah maybe that's mm. the, the, one of the ones from Pac-Man right <laughs> um yes oh so watch evil genius mm-hmm. um then cleanse your palate with a much less lower much more lower stakes mm-hmm. cr- crime mm-hmm. not a crime um and uh spay and neuter your pets yeah <laughs> they don't want, you don't want them out there Oh, all right. Uh, thank you, Lisa. Brad. I'm so good at podcasting, you guys. You are. Um, High fives all around. Uh, <laughs> yes. I'm just clapping. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, Brad, how was your, <laughs> how was your weekend door? This was one for the books, guys. Yeah. Um, Absolutely and utterly surreal. As I mentioned on the last week in Dork, I was gearing up to for an interview with Simon Pegg. That mm-hmm. interview happened on Monday. Oh my god, it was so awesome! It was a a great brief chat. It was Brad, like, let me listen to the audio. Oh, yeah, yeah. Twelve minutes long. <laughs> I really wish I could share it with you guys because I got him to laugh at one point, and that was like that, that was my dream come true. Uh, and he was super cool, very friendly. Um, we talked about his new film Terminal. Uh, but then, you know, I, I, and I was able to steer it away to Star Trek, which is what I wanted to talk yeah. about. So I was, I, was, I was pretty pleased with myself. Uh, and then, you know, on Tuesday, Brian didn't talk about it as Weekend Dork. Like, the dorkiest thing he did is he produced a pilot, oh, uh, yeah, the yeah. It Mod pilot. Oh, it's yeah, going to yeah, happen. Yeah. Uh-oh. That was an absolute highlight. Yeah. How was that? What was that like? That was great. Uh-huh. Was Darren and, and, and myself, so we, we were like, Darren, Darren was the host. Uh, I was the guest, and we did 11 minutes talking about the summer movie preview. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It was a, a project for, I'm taking classes at Montgomery County uh, Public Access, and it was just a, a final project. I had to produce a show, so I graciously asked uh, Mouth Dork and Disco Dork to be my talent, and they came out, and they, they did a great job. So it was a lot of fun. Guys. I was yeah. like, oh shit, I'm Arch Campbell. 
<laughs> uh, and then speaking of Arch Campbell, on Wednesday, I went out to the National Archives because the MPAA was doing a special advanced screening of First Reformed, the new Paul Schrader movie. Um, oh, yeah. And I got to check that out. And, uh, you know, I, w- I was curious about it, but I, I wasn't terribly excited about uh, about the film. Paul Schrader is an a- is a director who has made a lot of movies that I that I deeply admire. You know, Cat People is one of my all time favorite films. He wrote Taxi Driver. Uh, I really love Light Sleeper, um, Affliction, Autofocus. His last movie, though, was Dog Eat Dog with Nicolas Cage and Willem Dafoe. And I liked it, but I didn't love it. Um, he had a bit of a catastrophe with Dying of the Light. So I, I just wasn't super enthused about First Reformed. Um, before seeing it. Before seeing it. All right. I've seen it. I loved this movie. Mm-hmm. It is easily, without a doubt, his best film of the last 20 years. Mm-hmm. He wrote Taxi Driver. He wrote Taxi Driver, okay. yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, and uh, what's amazing about this film, and I don't want to talk too much about what it is, because I had not seen a trailer for it. Uh, I had only seen the image of Ethan Hawke in his, you know, priest outfit, his reverend outfit. Um, And and that's all I knew before the the film started. Uh, I'll say that, you know, Ethan Hawke plays uh, the Reverend Toller. He's struggling with the death of his son who went into service and died uh, in Iraq. And his marriage is split up and he found himself again in the church. And he's a pastor or a priest, or whatever they're called, Lisa, a reverend, reverend. Yeah, uh, of this tiny little church that's about to have an anniversary. Uh, it's 250th anniversary, and it's a it's an offshoot of a, one of these like mega churches. Uh, I forget what the mega church is called. It's like um, the Assumption of Life or some, <laughs> some nonsense. And and the the pastor there. Or the reverend there. I'm such a terrible alien. Yeah, he keeps movie. referring to me. I think that this movie is Protestant, not Catholic. Yeah, it's so. Protestant. It's Protestant. <laughs> so uh, I know. And so Fuck Cedric all. the Entertainer is the the main dude of that mega church. Interesting. And okay. they're all getting psyched up for this big uh, anniversary that they're going to make into a, an event with the governor and all these politicos and blah, blah, blah. And the story really takes off when Amanda Seyfried's uh, character asks uh, Ethan Hawke's character to talk to her husband who is suffering a serious case of despair. He just doesn't understand how we can go on with our lives given the state of the world today. And Ethan Hawke's character is also actually suffering despair. Hmm. And I'm watching the film, and I'm like, okay, this is pretty good. When Toller, the Hawke character, has a conversation with Michael, the, the, the husband the film becomes increasingly compelling and where it goes from that conversation, I don't want to spoil, but I loved this movie and the crowd I saw it with was, you know, the MPA crowd. It was senators, it was congressmen and it was Arch Campbell Mm. and, uh, you know, various other film critics and press. It was, you know, everyone was in a suit, not Brad. I don't (laughs) wear suits. (laughs) Um, and, uh, we're watching this movie. There's a, there comes a, t- a moment in the film where something happens you would not expect to happen in this kind of movie. I'm, I'm speaking in the most vaguest of terms. But you can hear this woman lean over to whoever she's seeing the film with. And in the loudest whisper possible, she goes, this movie's weird. <laughs> and from that moment on, I was like, yes. Paul Schrader, do it. Yeah. Get nuts. Yeah. And he does. But you think you know where this film is going, and it still manages to surprise you with its climax. Mm. And, you know, uh, Emily Sears, uh, a friend of the podcast, uh, writer for Birth Movies Death, she saw it at the Maryland Film Festival, and she was pretty lukewarm on it. I think I think she, she would even say that she was disappointed in it. And uh, – I, I'm the opposite. I think I think it's an amazing movie. It's easily one of my favorite films of the year. Like I said, it's one of Paul Schrader's best films of the last two decades. You know, he, he spoke afterwards and he talked about how that God's lonely man character, the, the, the character who sits in judgment 
uh, and disgust of society that we saw in Taxi Driver. He's returned to that character over and over and over again. That character's in Taxi Driver. That character's in uh, American Gigolo. That character is in Light Sleeper. That character is in The Walker. And that character is in First Reformed. Um, it's an ugly character. It's a troubling character. Uh, and it's it's been fascinating to see how he has evolved since Schrader created that archetype in his 20s. Hmm. And then, of course, you know, the more humble bragging, but the, the next day I actually got to meet with Paul Schrader in Georgetown over breakfast and have a conversation with him about his film. And that interview should be dropping, well, Monday, so hopefully when this episode's up, you can now slide on over to Film School Rejects and read that interview. Uh, I had a, a great time chatting with him. Uh, you know, just like with Simon Pegg, it's one of the most surreal moments in my life. Here I am in the room with a guy who wrote Taxi Driver uh, and and directed Cat People, let alone you know a dozen other really great movies. Yeah, uh, and yeah, it was cool. Well, you know, like what's great about Paul Schrader, he started out as a film critic. Uh, he did not see his first movie until he was 17, his family was extremely religious. Mm. Yeah, I read about and that. the first movie he saw was The Absent-Minded Professor, I oh. want to say, and he hated it. Yeah. And he's like, ugh, this is what I've been waiting for? No. Uh, but then he saw Robert Brisson's, uh Pickpocket, and that character in Pickpocket is basically the character that is in Taxi Driver and First Reformed. He, he's become obsessed with that movie, but he's he's still finding creative drive from contemporary cinema. The ratio of First Reformed is 4-3. Hmm. It's the ratio from Ida. Hmm. And he saw Ida and he's like, I want to steal that and make a movie with that ratio. Hmm. And that's what he's done. And he made First Reformed for $3.5 million. That's Crazy. the money you hmm. save shooting in 4-3. Those, those sides, they <laughs> cost a lot of money. <laughs> well, I mean, he would say the reason he, he chooses 4 threes. Uh, he's letting the audience know that he's not going to tell them everything. Mm. Uh, you know, you got to bring a lot of yourself to the movie. Hmm. Um, so I don't know. I loved First Reformed. Uh, it comes out uh, in DC uh, this Friday on the twenty sixth. Is that that Friday? Is that this Friday or is that the twenty fifth? I don't know. I don't know dates. <laughs> but it comes out Friday. Uh, I would eagerly. Um, rush to the cinema to check it out because I don't know if it's going to make a ton of money. It's mm. not um, a summer blockbuster entertainment by any means. Yeah. But if you are a fan of cinema and if you miss that old Paul Schrader experience, you'll find it here in First Reformed. And Ethan Hawke is great. Cedric the Entertainer is great. Amanda Seyfried's is great. Highly recommend. I can't believe mm. you're going to leave us hanging. What? What The people want to know, what does Paul Schrader eat for breakfast? Uh, he had a croissant. Oh, and nice. he devastated that croissant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> they're hard to eat. <laughs> like, they're cri they're crispy. They're crumbly. For the first like uh, ten minutes of our conversation, I was so focused on the amount of crumbs he was creating. <laughs> <laughs> so, if you want to be a screenwriter, chow down. Chow down on some croissants. I wonder mm -hmm. if other pastry would work. No croissant only. Mm -hmm. Because right. it's French. That's it. That's it. Yeah, that's my weekend work. That's my weekend work. I've been, I, I, I did watch a ton of Milos Forman movies uh, with Aaron. I'm now uh, co hosting with him on the Rest in Pictures podcast, and we just did an episode on Milos Forman. So I watched, you know, where my quotes from One Flew of the Cuckoo's Nest, Amadeus. Mm. And man, those are, that's awesome, awesome cinema there, too. Yeah. I guess, uh, speaking of rest in, in pictures, mm -hmm. uh, Margot Kidder, we haven't mentioned. Yeah, Margot Kidder passed away. That's going to be the next episode of Rest in Pictures. Um, yeah. And I think here, not to say that I'm excited about her being dead, uh, <laughs> but I'm excited to revisit not only, you know, Superman uh, and, and, and what have you, but also the films I haven't seen Brian De Palma's Sisters, Amityville Horror. Yeah. Part, you haven't seen Amityville Horror? Part two? Oh. Is she part two? She part one. She's one. She's one. Okay. She's part one. Yeah, and uh, no, Darren, I have not seen Amityville Horror. Really? Mm -hmm. No. I've seen that house. I've <laughs> seen the remake with Ryan Reynolds. Huh. Yeah. I didn't like it. Yeah. No. It's not. <laughs> yeah. Different movie. Uh, all right. Yeah. So for my weekend dork, I had a, uh, I had a pretty light weekend dork. I had a, a, a turtle esque weekend dork, <laughs> um, but I was determined to have something to talk about. 
on the podcast. So I was I was uh, going to my uh, my uh, Netflix uh, uh, app and scrolling through there trying to find something to watch. Uh, before I, I do want to mention, I did finish that um, documentary Evil Genius. Nice that Brad uh, talked about on the podcast for his weekend dork. Uh, last was that last last week, right? Yes, sir. Uh, that show, that documentary, that case, I want to say, is nuts. Um, if you haven't seen it, please do yourself a favor and check it out. There's a reason why people are talking about it. Um, it is worth your time. Uh, but be warned, as Brad uh, mentioned, there are some pretty uh, gruesome scenarios uh, that are documented in this uh, in the film because it's a it's a Although strange, it's uh, also a brutal and unfortunately sad case. Uh, but it is extremely compelling, so I highly recommend checking it out. Um, again, as someone who is a huge uh, interest in psychology, just the, the 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 human nature on display in this documentary is just mind boggling to me. Um, but please check it out. So anyway, but I do want to say I, I managed to come across a picture that I ended up uh, settling on when I was scrolling through Netflix. And it is um, Martin Freeman's new film, Cargo. And actually, I, IMDb has this dated for 2017. But I have only recently started hearing things about this film within the last couple of weeks. Uh, turns out it's a Netflix uh, picture. So I guess they acquired it at some point for distribution. Um, and so... I, I, I admittedly was not excited about watching this film. I have been seeing it on my timeline on social media for the past couple of weeks, and I've been seeing people say how great it is, um, how it's one of the best zombie movies in of the last you know ten years or whatever. Um, so I, I was all I was already going in it kind of uh, skeptical, and I will say this: um, I, I don't want to. If you don't know anything about the movie, don't read. Um, don't read anything. Don't read any descriptions. Um, the vaguest description I can give is, uh, and this is what's on IMDb, and it's actually pretty well good description. It says, Cargo is a post-apocalyptic thriller and an emotional story of a father trying to save his child at all costs. I'll just leave it at that. Um, it, it's, it takes place in a post-apocalyptic setting. There is a child involved, and you know that child's safety uh, being paramount is that it's also true in this case. But what I will say, I I was not expecting because the film, like the first two acts of the film, for me, weren't anything special. I just felt like sticking through it just so I can talk about the film as a whole. Um, Martin Freeman's character, I I I don't think I'm spoiling by saying like his character didn't have the type of character arc. He's not like a type of character where he's a father where. You know, there was something done in his past that still haunts him and he's got to make peace with that or that's got to come back and play into, you know, his character at the present or at the end of the film or something like that. It was just, he was just like a regular guy in this post-apocalyptic setting who was trying to take care of his, his, his family, his loved ones. And I mean, and that's that's really it regarding his character. So his personality wasn't anything where... He was like a gruff human being who had some type of past and like, you know, military training or anything like that. Or he was a, a, a shitty husband or a drunk. He was, he was just like a normal nice guy. He was like a normal nice guy. If the normal nice guy that you know, if the world ends because of zombie apocalypse, he's that guy just in the zombie apocalypse. So I kind of felt like he was, I kind of felt like he was just being like a nice Martin Freeman, like a like nice chummy dude, right? And so that for me, I didn't find that captivating initially, right? But I just kept watching the movie because I wanted to see it through the through the end. But then, like the third the third act happens, and the movie starts to kick up into like a different gear regarding the characters in it. And then, like the finale comes, and I'm not gonna spoil it, but. It was devastating. Like I have, mm. I have not. I mm. was, I was not expecting that. And there's a, there comes a point like early in the movie where you know what the movie's going to be. Like something happens and it says, "Okay, this is the movie." And you go, "Oh, okay. Well, I I know how this is going to end. You know how it's going to end." And it it does end the way you think it's going to end, or the way you know it to end. The baby being raised by zombies. No. 
Oh. Well, I, you know what? I'm not. You know what? I don't know. It, it does end the way you think it's going to end. But Her it, first word is brains. But it is. It doesn't do it or look or feel like how you expect. And it was extremely powerful. Brian, you talk about the the ending on of Train to Busan and like mm-hmm. how emotionally powerful that is. I talked about that. I talked about how that moment. This movie is worse. And I don't mean worse like in a bad way, but I mean as far as like an emotional gut punch. Mm. This movie takes the cake. And it was extremely rewarding. It was extremely unexpected too. Um Martin Freeman, like he's so good in this last he's good he's great throughout the entire film, but the but he is extremely exceptional at in at the in the la- his last moments of the film because of how he played that character in those first two acts of the film. And I don't know, I, 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 I have nothing but good things to say about this movie. Um, if you haven't seen it, it is definitely worth your time, even if it's just to see the end of that film. But Martin Freeman, he's, you know, in the, the filmmaking, he's directed by uh, a duo, Ben Howling and Yolanda Romke. And uh, from my understanding, there was a short film that this is adapted from that came out in 2013, um, I, I admittedly have not seen that, uh, but I'm curious to check it out. And I just only found this out like before we started recording uh, when I pulled up IMDb. Else I would have watched that uh, before we recorded. But I'm definitely l- looking forward to checking it out just to see where this film, um, the, the seeds of this film and where, where it came from and how it's changed from its short uh, feature format to this full-length uh, adaptation. Because I... I, I I don't know that I've been as emotionally affected by a zombie film as I was by the end of this film. And I'm really? Thinking, More than Girl with All the Gifts? The end of it? This movie, yes. The end of it, Shit. yes. Hmm. Yes. All right. I need to see this. Yeah. And it's just it's all due to like Martin Freeman. And then just the storytelling, how it sets that character. Because again, it... it it doesn't at the end. It doesn't get to the end and then pull a left to oh you you thought it was going to end like this or we're going to end like that, you know it's very clear about how the movie's going to end and it says you thought the movie was going to end like this well it is but we're going to make it feel like this. It ends with Martin Freeman getting bit and the baby having to kill him with her tiny baby fists. It's not far off from that. Oh shit! I'm so sorry. <laughs> like I said, it ends the way you think it is, but Aww. you feel like wow. Um, so, yeah, definitely check that out if you have not seen it. Um, that's going to do it for my week in Dork. I'm looking at the the stills on IMDb. I'm a little disappointed that Martin Freeman is not wearing cargo pants. I would think yeah. that those would be like the official pants of the apocalypse. Because you've yeah. got to carry shit around. And in the Australian around. Outback, too. That's, he, this movie takes place in, the, in Australia. I just want to hmm. mention that He's wearing well. long sleeves. That's got to be warm. Hmm. Maybe it's like a tick thing. Or like everything in... Can, like, you don't you. want you don't want zombies to bite your bare flesh, so you got to have the yeah. long sleeves. Does yeah. he do an accent? Mm, no, he does his normal accent, oh. uh, his normal voice. What um, about the baby? The baby does. She's got like this. No, I don't want to say weird. I don't want to offend anyone from Australia. She's got this Australian baby accent. Like when she says "wah," it's like an Australian "wah." <laughs> There's like a lot of vowels in there. Mm-hmm. Uh, but she's great. She's great in the film. And don't have a baby in a zombie apocalypse because you need silence. That's just and I, but I love that device. Quiet place, man. Quiet place, but I, but I love that that built in, that built in suspension and drama with just that in and of itself. Like you have a child, and if there's zombies around that are sensitive to sound, just that you know that automatically builds tension, and I and I love that. And the movie does some really um, outstanding things with that. The, is the baby's name Rosie? Yes. Rosie is played by four babies. Yep. I did not know that. <laughs> 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 I'm gonna just start with agreeing with shit that surprises me. Um, so yeah, that's gonna do it for my week of dork. All right, uh, when we come back from the break, we're gonna do our review cast for uh, Marvel's Deadpool, starring Ryan Reynolds and Moraine Morena Baccarano, Baccarano, Baccarin, Baccarin, and from uh, Firefly. Yes, and uh, Zazie Beats. Oh my goodness, from my heart. From my heart, from my soul. All right, let's, <laughs> let's, let's, let's just hurry and come back from this break so I can talk about her. She's my good. That's it. It's just her. I love her. She's my great. She's my everything. Oh, you should see my face right now. I'm blushing. Thank you about her. I'm not, is. I'm not even, I don't even have her pulled up on my screen. I'm just blushing. That's so um, sweet. So, yeah, let's hurry and come back so I can talk about Zazzy Beats. I mean, Deadpool 2. Uh, stick around. 
You like film, from cult to classic, from blockbuster to B-movies. And there just isn't that one place with all the fan fervor and passion that's covering the kind of mad, diverse brilliance that you love. Well, that's where you're wrong! AfterMovieDiner.com is that fan-built movie nirvana just for you, featuring the sweet, sweet writings of the wife dork herself. AfterMovieDiner.com. Go there. Be the best you can be. And we're back, ladies and gentlemen. And this week, our review cast is for... Deadpool 2, starring Ryan Reynolds and uh, a bunch of other people. Um, Brad Pitt. Brad Pitt. Spoilers. Spoilers. Yeah, spoiler. If you haven't seen the movie yet, you're going to want to do that before listening to this review cast. I've seen the movie and didn't even see him in it. Oh, really? Are you serious? No, I didn't. Did you catch Stan Lee's cameo? No, I didn't. Uh, he's graffiti on the wall. Oh, I, I missed a lot in that movie. <laughs> if you haven't seen Deadpool 2 yet... Mm-hmm. This is a great time mm-hmm. to go on iTunes. Yes. Give us five stars. Yes. That first half was pretty fucking strong. Mm-hmm. 55 minutes of free entertainment. Yes. The least you can do is give us five stars and say something really sweet about me. Mm-hmm. Oh, yes. Specifically. Yeah. And then you can watch the movie, then come back and uh, be a part of this conversation. So, as always, we're going to start with our, our good. We're going to go through the good, the bad, the ugly of Deadpool. Um, first, before we start oh. talking about Deadpool, the, well, the good, the bad, the ugly, um, were you all looking forward to Deadpool? Like, what no. were your thoughts on the first film? No. Hmm. Here, do you know what these are? Do you know what those are? They're my nun fucks. I give nun fucks for oh, Deadpool. Oh, 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 oh. Oh, okay. <laughs> for one or two? Either one. Okay. Uh, Brad? Um, I was not a huge fan of the first Deadpool, mm-hmm. uh, so, but I'm always looking forward to movies. Mm-hmm. All right, uh, <laughs> Brian. Um, I recently rewatched the first Deadpool. I enjoyed it when I watched it the first time. Uh, watched it a couple of months back, and I really enjoyed the the first movie. Um, I thought I thought it had a good balance between tones and 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 heart with the love story. Um, and staying true to, uh, I guess, who the character of Deadpool was, and really being able to kind of showcase that. But um, yeah, so I was, I was, I was on board for Deadpool too. Was I excited for it? Um, can't say I was like extremely excited, but I was looking forward to it. Okay, uh, I'm a huge fan of Ryan Reynolds as that character. I enjoy the first film. I rewatched it the night before. I watched that Wednesday. Before seeing it on Thursday, seeing Deadpool two on Thursday, uh, as just a refresher, and um, even from the, my first viewing theatrically, like I, I've just enjoyed Ryan Reynolds as that character. Now, sometimes like some of the jokes, whether it be in the first film or the second film, may fall flat. But as far as you know, an, an actor who was born to play a character, just Ryan Reynolds was doing Deadpool, and his his he was doing that like in Van Wilder, he was doing that character way before that character was, you know, uh, a cinematic thing. And he just the, his personality, his sarcasm, his his uh his humor, his timing, like it for me I just it's perfect for this character. And I and I know that this character isn't even 100% like uh the character from the comic books, but for what he is cinematically, like I I really enjoy him in that role. And I enjoyed the first film um and I enjoy the relationship between uh, Vanessa and Wade. And I like how the first film establishes that, and I like what they do with it with the second film. But um, to a- answer my own question, I was l- looking forward to uh, Deadpool 2. So uh, having said that, now let's go around with the good, the bad, the ugly. Brian, the good of Deadpool 2. So for me... Um... <sighs> Coming off of Deadpool 1, uh, with everything I said, that I, re- that I really enjoyed this film. Um, Letterbox, I gave it four stars for the first film. Uh, this film, uh, it's dis- this is, disappointed. This is, this is the good, Brian. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you're right. Sorry, sorry. We'll, we'll get to that later. Um, but yeah, so, I mean, but with that being said, there was some good and not a lot for me personally. Again, I've only seen the film once, and even seeing the film once, I really have no desire to see it the second time or to rush and see it. But what I did enjoy about this film was a lot of the set pieces, some of the action set pieces, uh, most notably the third act. I thought the third act was really, really fun to really kind of get into when we get back to the mansion uh, with um, 
with uh, Julian Dennison's character. I forget his Russell. Name. Russell. When we get Fire uh, Fist, and uh, I know this is spoilers, but the other character that was introduced halfway through, uh, Juggernaut. Juggernaut. Um, and then uh, having the the team come, and then that kind of final uh, confrontation, I thought was really really fun. Um, and then it's kind of all shooting off that the characters. Um, I thought Domino was a standout. Mm-hmm. Um, she was absolutely amazing. Um, I kind of wish they would have had more of her and Cable. To to a, I enjoy Cable, but to a lesser degree. I thought Josh Brolin was was good in the role. I love the design of the character. Um, you know, with with the arm and everything that we see with that. Um, and also another character that I liked in this film, coming from the first film, was Colossus. I really enjoyed the character. <laughs> I did. I'm not going to lie. I did. I, I like continuing that relationship that he has with Wade, um, almost him being kind of like that moral compass with trying to find the good in Wade, trying to recruit him to be an X-Men, um, and just really trying to bring something good out of Wade to, that he can offer to the team. And then ultimately just where his character goes and the stuff that he's able to do in this in this film, you know, especially during the big CGI fight. Uh, but, um, yeah, the, the third act, those characters, those were probably um, some of the things that I enjoyed uh, the most. Um, the opening was, was kind of strong, but then it kind of went – it kind of – went into a different direction that I'll talk a little bit more uh, with with uh, my bad. But, okay. um, yeah, those are probably what I like. All right. Uh, Lisa? Yes. Um, I sound, found some of the violence super fun. Um, you can always count on Deadpool to be splashy and woundy and bloody, and Ooh. I find that fun. And I, I thought that, for the most part, it was kept pretty – even though it was fast-paced, it was – kept pretty crisp and clear so you could really see everything and i and i i find that fun um i i also really liked the character of domino the fact that her superpower is being lucky i think um brought a lot of humor just just i love the rube goldberg machine of of how everything seems to work out for her i find that to be like a super fun idea and and kind of a nice um a nice juxtaposition to Deadpool who who like nothing seems to go his way but because he's he's got he's indestructible and he's got superpowers things just kind of more or less you know they end up working out for him yeah. you know he needs to grow new legs every once in a while yeah um <laughs> but yeah i also really liked Josh Brolin as Cable hmm. Um, the way he looked, yeah. <laughs> I thought that that was just kind of a super cool look yeah. and this will probably come up in Brad's good because Brad was Full on swooning every time Josh Brolin was on the screen. Really? Yeah, I, I, I mean, I would not be surprised if, you know, we find Brad just doodling B G hearts J B. I, I, I don't see any cable in his toys nope, on, notebook on, on the shelf yet. In yeah. the, in the other they're room, all there's in a, the bedroom. <laughs> we do, we do have some cable toys. Um, what else did I like? What about Ricky Baker? No, I, I, I he he's gonna come up later. Uh, like, <laughs> it's not that I didn't enjoy his performance. Mm. I thought that he was underused. Mm. I think that um, in uh, uh, it's gonna come up later. Okay, yeah. I, right. I have think I have things. I love him as an actor. Yeah. I think that he is, you know, super funny, and and I think that he finds a depth of character even in the the brief time that he's on the screen. Mm. So I, right. I thought that that was good. Yeah. Um, yes. Okay. Uh, Brad. Yes. Josh Brolin. I love that dude. Um, <laughs> I love the design of Cable. Yeah. Uh, I like the attitude of Cable. I think Brolin brings a lot to that role. You know, as with Deadpool himself, they're they're not characters that I have much fondness towards. Mm. Uh, I was never a big uh, New Mutants or X Force fan growing up when these characters reign supreme, although both of them have evolved greatly since the 90s as to what they are now and how we see them in the comic book. Uh, but yeah, so Brolin, I, I, every time Brolin was on screen, I was exhilarated. Uh, that o- is a, a, the way, another way of saying super hard. Yeah, <laughs> I was rock hard. Uh, like his abs and his fucking biceps, man. Yeah, yeah. Oh my God. 
Yeah. He looks like the beef that Rocky was practicing on in the first uh, <laughs> Rocky film. Uh, Deadpool, uh, I, I still am just, I get a, a real kick out of seeing that costume Same. moving. Same. You know? yeah. uh, and, and in particular, the opening credits of this film where Wade Wilson's breaking the fourth wall, saying, you know, he's playing with that Logan. Uh, music box yeah. and going, you know, like this fucking Logan, you know, he dies at the end. Well, guess what? This movie's also going to die with me at the end, or this movie's going to end with me dead at the end. Uh, I liked all that, and I especially love the slow mo severed head flying yeah. towards camera. Yeah. What about the James Bond esque opening? Oh, and I love, yeah, that was funny. I, I really liked the, the that opening. And, and to be honest, like from that moment on, I was like, shit, I'm really excited for this movie suddenly. I love Zazie Beetz in the movie. Mm. Um, I think he, she brings a lot of personality, mm. uh, much needed personality mm-hmm. to the X Force team. Um, I like how the X Force team gets dispatched almost immediately. I love that. <laughs> yeah, I love uh, that. I, I honestly, I was shocked when Terry <laughs> Crews goes right into the bus. And I was like, oh, he landed in the bus. That's hilarious. That's funny. Yeah, That's but, funny. Yeah. Oh, shit. That dude's cut up. He's oh, dead. he's dead. <laughs> and then Shatterstar goes right into the helicopter. Yeah. I was dying. I was dying. And um, then Brad Pitt is Mr. Vanish. He's yeah, the, yeah, I know. I know and you didn't yeah. see him when no. he grabs the thing and his face comes up? Yeah. No. Oh, no. damn. Okay. I, was, uh, well, I thought that shit was I, I, I mean, I Were was, you on your phone? I, no, I was looking at. I just maybe I wasn't paying attention to the screen. I mean, I, I saw when he. Well, I the I wires, missed the other it, two cameos. I missed that Alan Tudyk and Matt yeah. Damon are in this movie. Yeah. Oh yeah, the yeah. old guys when he first the rednecks. Yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, I, I didn't catch that until I was listening to a podcast. Yeah. Um. So I liked all that. Uh. uh what else did I like about it? That's it. <laughs> All right. Um, well, I guess it's safe to say I'll be the one who's uh, carrying all the good. Um, I, again, I, I just enjoy the character. Uh, like Brad, I enjoy seeing that costume. I was literally thinking that well, the first time I watched uh, Deadpool 2 was, God, I love seeing this costume on screen just the, the same way yeah. I do... It's so I have never I don't think I've ever said this on the podcast before, but whenever I see Spider Man, like whenever yeah. I see someone in the Spider Man costume, mm-hmm. whether it be uh Toby Maguire or um uh Tom Holland. It's a thrill. When they're when when it's not the CGI version, when someone act, is actually wearing that costume and it, it it happens like at random times when I'm watching one of those movies. Uh, one of those I can't believe that that's a sp- that's Spider Man. Like yeah. in, to me with Deadpool, what I love so much is how they treat his eyes. Right? Yeah. I mean, they are very cartoon ish, yes. and they embrace the expressions of the Deadpool comic book character. Yeah. So to see that translated in, at any point is like a, a genuine thrill. I enjoy that. Um, Carrie, what I one of the things that I, I initially enjoyed about the film was how and. Too bad we've spoiled some stuff already. A spoiler alert: We're going to spoil this film. Um, how on the opening it's of not the too film? Bad. Well, because you've already spoiled yeah. one thing. Yeah, I've spo- we we said at the beginning we're going to spoil we this thing. Yeah, I don't we think did. You put no, a disclaimer out. Yeah. You you have to focus, Darren. Oh, sorry. Uh, we always so, spoil. Yes, we do. Um, so I like at the beginning of the film when Vanessa is killed. That that's the catalyst for uh, Deadpool's character arc for the rest of the film and. I enjoyed how they they really this film I feel like the 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 relationship with them between the two characters worked because um I, I bought for me personally I bought it in the first film and it's a continuation of it and it would be his motivation. So whenever he would return back to her so whenever he when he would go to that the 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 wherever he is in that the realm where her body's in limbo whatever that is and how he couldn't get to, how he couldn't get to her, and because he had to decode the message that she was trying to tell him, you know, your heart's not in it, in the right place, blah 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 blah. But when he finally breaks through at the end, and when he comes through the other side, he's normal Ryan Reynolds, and I like how that's a call back to the Aha video from Take on Me, and then that song is playing, but it's like this um, this love song version of it, like this this vocal solo of it. And I found that really freaking sweet. Like, I found that really effective, especially, like, because the character, like, Deadpool, on the surface, like, he's this jokey character that um, finds humor in every situation. He can barely take any situation seriously. Um, and and that's fine, like, especially, like, for the comic books. But I think, like, with the film, 
if you're gonna have, you have to, I guess, maybe ground or center a character. And I like that they use his relationship with Vanessa as f- as far as how to uh, ground that that person. Because even when Ryan Reynolds plays that uh, that role at that point when he finally is able to see her again, and um, but then he's called back. Like I, f- I felt like it was like really bittersweet when she tells him, you know, I'm glad you're here, but it's not time. You have to go back. And he's like, "Why? I don't want to go." Like I found, I found that that moment like really bittersweet. Um, again, I like Zazie Beats. She is the best thing about this movie. Uh, I was really excited to see her going into the film, and the way that they came up with the different, um, you know, her 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 moments of luck. How you know they were able to be creative in that in that regard. Like I found really entertaining. The action sequences. I mean, this is directed by. You know, one of the directors, David of, Leach, David Leach of John Wick fame, and the opening scene when um, uh, Deadpool is in China and he there's that action yeah. sequence in, in the in that uh, that that high rise. I thought that was very yeah. well done. It does what Lisa was talking about about it being like uh, really bloody and splashy and, and and comical, but also really inventive in like the action sequence and what Deadpool was doing and how he was dispatching those people. Um, like the opening again, going back to when Vanessa's kill, when he leaps out of the window to grab the guy who shot her, like that whole sequence, um, you know, he, he makes the joke, you know, t- talking about, um, cable being dark and what are you from the DC universe, but that whole entire sequence, like from when dead, when she, Vanessa gets shot and Deadpool goes down to when he jumps out and, and grabs that guy and kills him. Like, I remember thinking the second time I watched it, which was today, um, like, that sequence in and of itself was, like, really dark, especially for that particular character. But And that action scene before she gets shot where he is holding onto the knife, knife block, block yeah. and removing knives, oh, that yeah. is a great scene. It's badass. Um, this, this, the action sequence is uh, in the prison once Dable, uh, Dable, once Cable uh, is teleported to the the icebox, the supermax, not the supermax prison, but the icebox prison, and he, he breaks in and he's fighting... Like I thought that action sequence was uh very well done. Um I like uh Ricky Baker. I like that they were the not all of the jokes hit for me. Um but I enjoyed the experience it, you know, of watching it with the audience that it did hit for them cuz like the audience Dude, loved the, that movie. The audience that Lisa and I saw over at the Alamo on opening night, yeah. they were slayed. They were Dying watching yeah. that movie, and uh, that's how both audiences were with me, and that that made it fun. Even with, even for the jokes that didn't stick, like I love that that movie was having that reaction to to that audience. Those people were having a good time, and for me, that's infectious. I I like when people are having a good time, even if it's not me. So I, I love that. Um, I like the callbacks to the first film, and having watched the first film yeah. the night before, the cure for blindness. That's the one, man. It's so if it's so simple and it's so quick, yeah. but it was so hilarious because I had just the fact that I remembered it because I had just watched it the night before. I yeah. might not have remembered it had same. I same. I did the exact same thing you did. I watched it the day before, and and because I it was fresh in my mind when I saw that it's a quick throwaway shot, but I thought that was freaking yeah. hilarious. There's actually a lot of callbacks to the first film, joke yeah. wise. Yeah, and um, I, I don't know, like, and I liked uh, Dopender. Uh, his just his just his voice. Is so soothing and comical to me. I like. Uh, I hope that he really becomes an X Force member. I hope so too. Because I, I, I like, I like the image of him being being part of the team. Yeah, I love how pissed he is when Peter gets. Like, yeah, oh, yeah, that was yes, funny. That was fucking hilarious. Yeah. I'm adding him to my. I'm adding him to my good. Dopender. Could you edit that in? Actually, yes, I can. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, I, I enjoy Dopender and. Um, the story, like I, the story didn't go how I thought it was. I thought, I thought um, Russell, who is uh, the character um, played by the dude from Hunt for the Wilder People. Sorry, I can't remember his name. Julian right Dennison. Now. Yeah, Julian Dennison. I thought that Cable was going to be like a future version of him yeah. and like some other yeah. weird shit. But luckily, like the movie didn't play out the way I expected it. Um, and and like I and I appreciated that. Um, so yeah, and the, the action sequence when the X Force that we talked about that we spoiled when the X Force has to uh, save Russell from this convoy. That's a really long extended sequence. It starts with them jumping out of the plane. They, they keep it, talking about how the wind is up. <laughs> yeah, so right, like right before that, um, um, T.J. Miller says something about the wind, and it's like almost like a throwaway line or whatever. But how that plays into like X Force dying. <laughs> It's fucking hilarious, and then how like it like Ryan Reynolds makes one more callback to it when 
um, he's he's assuming that Cable wants to join X Force, and he says something about the wind being up, and he kind of winks at Domino, and she's like, "What the fuck?" But um, that that sequence when he because that so again that is an extended sequence when they jump out of the plane, and it ends with his fight with Juggernaut. But I just thought that entire sequence was freaking awesome because uh, after X Force gets dispatched, we we follow Zazie Beats as she says, "All right, I'm going in," and she uses her luck to get in the truck and commandeered, and then Cable gets uh, on board. Yeah, it's not terribly cinematic luck. <laughs> right, and then, it, then that it, 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 that sequence ends with them crashing down on that overpass, and then Juggernaut rips Deadpool in half, and like I thought that sequence was freaking outstanding and very entertaining. But anyway, the next sequence picks up with like Wade Wilson back at his place with Blind Al, and like he's been ripped in half, so he's regenerating his legs, like that, like everything that they were saying regarding his legs, like all that <laughs> shit killed me, man, because it, it's just such a weird, it's just a really weird sight gag, and I just love like. I could tell it was like a lot of improving, and they were just picking like the best takes. And so I, I love those types of scenes uh, in films, especially when they're funny. And I thought this one was extremely funny. Um, I like seeing the X Force Deadpool uh, costume at the end of the film. I like that blast. also. Yeah, like they just put the biggest smile on my face. Yeah. Um, and so uh, yeah, there's a bunch I liked about it. But I, I thought don't... of another thing I thought was good. Okay, I liked when he had, even though this Darren was big time looking out for me and warned me of the the two vomit scenes. The one in the prison where um, where it's just sound. Mm. And then, of course, with the zeitgeist later, that yeah. would have fucking traumatized me. So yeah. thank you so very much. Look, Darren's looking out for the emetophobe on the cast. Um, but I like the idea of, like, when Deadpool is wearing the collar, he goes right back to growing tumors. Like, yeah. his superpower, uh, along with his super strength and indestructibility... Like, one of his superpowers is not growing tumors. Mm-hmm. Like, I, I find that really, really interesting. Yeah. And um, and the and his desire to die, I think, is really interesting yeah. as a as a character. Yeah. I should have taken notes before. Um, I, 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 I do, too. Um, and that, I mean, that, that whole, again, but that all ties back to Vanessa and her death. That, for me, like, it was a through line through the story. Because when he was attempting to when he was willing to die um a lot of his jokes centered around that hey kid i don't have my superpowers i'm nothing i'm just i'm just a bag of tumors give me a bow and arrow i might as well be hawkeye like yeah. i got thought all that shit was funny but i like the fact that you know him there were moments when he was serious like when he was at rock bottom and he was not trying to be russell's friend and how he played those scenes i mean I, you i me personally i genuinely feel bad for russell when he's telling him you know you just find the biggest guy in here, but don't try to shank him. Like, make him your friend. Any Anybody, just not me. Black Tom Cassidy. Yeah, and so I like how Wade is pushing him away, but it's also, it's mean, but at the same time, it's because he's so hurt. And he finds purpose in Russell through Vanessa. So even though she's gone, like, her presence is something that still drives that character. And again, like, it just, it for me, it all culminates when he finally... At the end, when he says, "Look, don't take my collar off. Just let it let it happen. I want it to happen. I'm so hurt without her that I want to die to still be with her. Even after all that stuff he's gone through, even after say you know helping Russell and 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 changing the course of the future and saving uh, Cable's family, even after all that, helping those people in the way that he did, he still just wants to be with Vanessa. He still just wants to die. And when he refuses that collar and he dies." Again, that for me, that payoff that scene, was that scene when he finally gets to break through that wall and how it it mirrors like the aha video when he breaks through and he's a normal person. And then when he breaks through, he's not scarred up as he was. And that's his version of heaven. And it's bittersweet because the second time it was even more bittersweet because I know he's about to get sucked back out. And so, I don't know, like I just, I really enjoyed that. I really enjoyed that about the film. What do you think about the the time turner and so now she's not going to be dead in the next oh, movie anyway. That, well, that I mean that we're fine with that because we're fine with the Thanos snap, so we can't be. <laughs> well, well, well I mean, on one hand, I mean, I could see how people would be like feel cheated, but for me, that just feels. I mean, it feels like something Deadpool would do. Like it just it feels appropriate for the character in the film um, because he says it. He's like, if you had to, you know, fuck, Bob, you know, if you had the, the the chance to do it, you you know, to save your loved one and go back, you do it too. And and he admits it. He said, of, of course I would, but I wouldn't kill a kid. So, like, the fact that he, he did that, uh, you know, and that's another good. I really enjoy the post-credit stingers. Um, they're, not, they're a mid-credit sequence, so audience, uh, you can leave after the mid-credit stingers. There's nothing post-credit. Uh, but I found those very funny and entertaining, him going back, uh, killing the Deadpool from the Wolverine X-Men Origins film. I thought that was funny. Um, so, yeah, that was the good. All right. 
Um, <laughs> Brian, the bad. Uh, I'm not going to take up too much time. Um, the, the bad for me mm-hmm. is, is um, well, I don't know. I don't, I didn't, the opening, uh, the opening of the film and the way Vanessa died, um, I wasn't that thrilled about, um, as far as like who killed her and, and how she died. Um, I don't know. It just, that, it, it, it kind of took me, I won't say it took me out of the film. But I, I think really, it's terrible. I couldn't really get engaged with the film. It's just like, you kind of have like this cold opening with montages of him going through like some of these different cities and taking out some bad guys and, you know, then these bad guys come back and one breaks in, uh, the one he leaves alive and is the one that kills Vanessa. It's kind of me- an Uncle Ben, what is this mm-hmm. Uncle Ben situation? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it just it just didn't seem to really kind of have that emotional uh, weight that I kind of wanted if you were going to kill that character off. And I, t- I was talking to Darren about this yesterday and it's something I wanted to bring up. It's like, I don't like rewriting the film, but I thought what could have made it a little bit better or at least more impactful for me is that if you could have carried over the character of Francis from the first film and maybe he be the impetus to kind of push that narrative thread forward I by mean, having to, him to me, kill her. I really dislike the fact that one of the most unique aspects of the Deadpool movie character is this relationship. Mm-hmm. And the writers don't know how to deal with this character's relationship with uh, his love interest. So we're going to do what every sequel does. We're going to kill her off. Mm. And, you know, it's another woman dying to benefit a man's cat, story. Yeah, his, and his it's like, that, like, this isn't Death Wish, you know? Like, we've, we've moved beyond this. Uh, Baccarin is a tr- cr- tremendously interesting actor. Yeah. And to rob the film of her is a disservice. But she's still in the movie, like well, a lot. She, she comes back a lot, to, mm-hmm. and they are emotionally effective scenes because she's a great actress. Yeah, yeah. And I am happy that they did the Time Turner thing yeah. and to bring her back. But I just thought that was a super cliche um, and irritating way to send Deadpool on his... Journey. Journey. And yeah. it's still, it yeah. is like redoing an origin story. Like, he still has plenty of motivation to fight crimes. Yeah, yeah. So that was like one of my, my big issues with the film that really kind of caught me off guard. I didn't know they were going to take the film in that direction. Um, something else, uh, the the just the main story for me just felt way too derivative of films that we've seen before. And I think it's kind of... Maybe it's a little hard to escape the trappings of that because of the character of Cable. Um, it feels a lot like Looper. feels a lot like t- uh, Terminator. But again, maybe it's hard to kind of escape that because of who c- the character of Cable is coming but from But they the completely future. changed it from the comic books. I mean, he mm-hmm. does come from the future, and so they did give him a Terminator plot line. Yeah. Um, I mean, they basically just lifted it straight. And from they the camera, even so. used Terminator like musical cues yeah, in it too. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. they were aware of that. And I feel like they could, if they had pushed that, if they had uh, uh, leaned harder on the Cameron ripoff, it could have been funny. Yeah, they probably could have played yeah. it up a little bit yeah. more. Um, that's another thing. Is some of the jokes for me didn't really hit. Um, I mentioned this in my my short review. I mean, I like references to other movies and universes and stuff like that, but just mentioning that, to me, it's just not enough to just have it be funny. Um, you know, the Martha joke in the beginning, you know, gets a chuckle, and a lot of the stuff to, uh, aimed towards DC and Hawkeye and the stuff towards Rob Liefeld, Can't Draw Feet and stuff like that. It's, <laughs> I mean, it's it's funny, but to me, a lot of it seems kind of inside baseball as well, where it's, it's like I think some people would get it, some people won't. That's that's cool um, to have those jokes for the diehard fans, but a lot of times I think it's it, it just doesn't hit, especially in the way that it's constructed in the film. Like, that badass scene with Domino, I mean, you pretty much have uh, uh, Deadpool basically talking over everything that she's doing, and it kind of pulls away from, you know, watching her do her thing in that long one-take sequence. Um, I mean, it's cool, but I, I don't know. It's just a lot of the jokes for me just didn't didn't land um, thinking about it in retrospect. Um I'm trying to think of anything else that I mean, some of the CG, some of the visual effects weren't all that great. It looked kind of rushed to me a little bit. Um, but really, it was just a lot of story points that I really just 
wasn't on board with. But I do like the relationship because that continues to be the heart of the this franchise, continuing that from the first film uh, between him and Vanessa and where that story goes and that being kind of the motivation for, you know, where Deadpool's character ultimately goes at the end. Um, speaking of jokes, oh, so what are you going to say? Well, I was just saying, you know, the time turner thing, at the very least, if she comes back and is a significant character in a third film or an X-Force movie or what have you, mm-hmm. I might be less angry with how she's treated in this movie. Yeah, hopefully. Hopefully they, they do do something um uh, yeah, with her character, I wasn't. I didn't. I wasn't a big fan of the X Force stuff. Um, the way they got decapitated and dispatched. I thought that was funny. <laughs> yeah, I, I just for me it just didn't work. Because I mean, again, it goes back to what we said with uh, Infinity War. With they they do a lot of misdirection in the trailers, mm-hmm. and in the Deadpool trailers, there were certain scenes that you actually they see, shot. Yeah, yeah, you see X Force actually, you know, in some of the action sequences, and I was expecting to see some of that. And then like when you first see Terry Crews get hit by the bus. <laughs> I mean, it's a, it's a funny sight gag, but then I was just like, okay, it's like to me, it was like, what was the point of even having them in there? I mean, I, I mean, I guess I can, I, I guess I get it. I mean, I, well, I do get it. It just doesn't work for me. I just didn't think it was funny. It just, it was pointless to me. Um, I, I don't know. And again, a lot of the cameos, like Brad Pitt, I didn't know until maybe I just wasn't looking. But I just, I honestly, I couldn't really get engaged in the film from the beginning. I mean, I was enjoying watching it. But I just wasn't invested in the story, and I think that was mainly it. Is like I, to me, I thought the story was kind of weak. Um, but yeah, those are some of my bad. All right, life door. I, I think that the story weakness comes from um, the movie kind of being a little bit plot dense, like big yeah. idea plot dense. Yeah. And where I f- especially compared to the first film, yeah, I think maybe they were answering some kind of criticism to the first film. Um, but to me, like the plot that I thought got really underplayed to the detriment of the film was, um, the story with Russell, with Julian Dennison. And, um, they were doing this kind of pray away the gay metaphor with him where, you know, he's sent to this, um, mutant reform school where someone calls him an abomination like that. Like, that is a huge metaphor to draw and something that takes a tremendous amount of time, I think, and care. Um, but also a metaphor that's been used. Oh, positively, yeah. positively. And they even, even poke in, fun at that in this film. You know, they, saying like, oh, this tired 60s uh, racism metaphor that is the X-Men. Right, yeah. So, so like... You know, and we've seen that in X Men comics at, that the idea of now the mutant gene is being used as a parallel for being gay and having to come right. out of the closet. And the and the, all all the films, or at least X two, uh, and and actually the Last Stand quite a bit too. Right, but to me, I think that like if that plot was done with a lot of care and sensitivity and a lot of time, I I think that I it could be more effective, but also hard to pull off in a comedy film. Like I don't, I like, I don't find that funny. Yeah. Um, also, and, and I felt like the, that Julian Dennison was underused, especially having seen him in hunt for the wilder people. He's extremely funny and dynamic. And I just kind of found him a little dreary. How do they not reference the skucks life? I know. Like he, know. Ma- he does that. Like, it's great to be a gangster. Yeah. Like that would be the, yeah. like the perfect the place. Moment. I know. I love hearing that. I think that would be the perfect place. I also think that um, Brianna Hildebrand's character underused. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I I thought oh, the yeah. thing I I thought the thing with the girlfriend saying hi to Deadpool. I thought that was like a kind of like a cute gag. Oh, Ugh. Brad's going Ugh. no. I I thought it was kind of cute. Yeah. I I don't know. Um, but I I just felt like this. And then you know, like him dealing with his wife's death and having this like suicide desire and like. Those are some like pretty heavy subjects, yeah. and I think it was just a, a lot to be squeezed in. And I think that the X Force thing was really funny and would have paid off way harder if they spent more time with that that plot line. Yeah, I think that that could like not pun not intended. I think that could have hit really hard. Yeah, I think I think that's probably what it was. If we had a little bit more time, because literally from when they had that introduction scene, it just seems like that parachute sequence uh happened right after <laughs> and i don't know it just it's just for me it just didn't work in the execution of it right 
Also, I was not. Uh, well, I guess this could go in my ugly. Never mind. I'll okay. save that for later. All right. Be your bad. Uh, I mean, I echo both what Brian and Lisa have said. Uh, you know, I love the joke of the X Force dying, mm-hmm. but and, and you know they're killing characters that are not yeah. um, the most celebrated. You know, you know Shatterstar is probably the most popular of that group, mm-hmm. but no one cares about Bedlam. No one cares about Zeitgeist. You know, nobody cares about Peter. That being said. I think my overall problem with Deadpool 2 is that it's very much a 20th Century Fox version of a comic book movie. These they don't embrace the characters. You know, this there are elements where this is a, a version of Deadpool that we have read before, but it really is Van Wilder. It's less Deadpool from the books and more Van Wilder. Um Cable is not at all like he is in the books. Uh, and then you know Domino, Shatterstar, all the like. The, it this is uh, a Hollywood's idea of what a comic book movie is. But we have that with Guardians of the Galaxy, where they're remaking characters. But it's a it's where it's done well. So, like if you're going to do True. something like that, you have to nail it. Yeah, agreed, agreed. Uh, and, and 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 from my point of view, the comedy mostly doesn't work. Uh, I found it very long, um, and yeah, and I you know. There are there are moments where it's like oh cue the CG fight and you're like oh okay but then you watch the CG fight and you're just like well that's garbage it's not funny okay he puts a hose up his ass All right. oh yeah uh, but you know uh, yeah no I don't like it <laughs> I didn't like the movie I didn't like the movie there were things in it that I like I love the costume and everything I said in the good yeah but overall I was really disappointed yeah all right uh, for my bad I don't have a lot of bad there were some. Um, some, some wonky CGI here and there, but, um, nothing to really take me out of the film. Uh, some of the, some of the jokes, um, didn't stick for me. And I would say that that'd be about it as far as my bad. Um, yeah, I, I don't have too much bad to say about the film. Um, and if I do, I can't think of it right now, but yeah, that's, that's all I got. So for the ugly Brian. Um, not much ugly, and I mean there is some ugly, but I kind of uh, I still thought it was kind of funny. I think the 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 whole scene with the baby legs. Oh my god! Is, <laughs> I mean it, is it, it went on kind of long, but some of that stuff was funny, like him crossing his legs, and then when you first see the baby legs, and then him standing up and walking up to Cable, the sight of it. I mean, and to call back, you know, to the first film with the the baby hand, and now you you know again as a C you see equalizing by making it bigger and more I guess whatever by doing it with the legs uh I don't know it, it was just weird to see um kind of ugly <laughs> but it, I, I I thought it was a great sight gag so um, does it just be like whichever part is attached to his head is the part that grows back like because his head gets blown off in this movie is there yeah, like a situation is, yeah. where he had like a little baby body and who took care of that little baby body well, he most definitely had a baby body and it's interesting too I would have cradled if, that little baby body because when Juggernaut splits him in half like could there be two Deadpools like what if his bottom no, half it's grew? only from his brain I don't know. I guess it's kind of a moot point. Yeah. Because um, then every time he cut his fingernails, it would just be like more Deadpools. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, any uh, Anything ugly? Not, nothing. That's about it that really kind of stands out as far as the ugly uh, for me in this film. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, wife door? <laughs> um,. I thought that the baby legs scene was funny. Yeah. I thought that the baby penis was tasteless. Oh. As much as I'm a fan of seeing dong on film. Oh. Right. Like I don't need to see baby dong. I like that's I that's where I, that is Isn't that's even not even that where point, I though? draw Isn't like a ding. Oh, that's now you're making it cute. <laughs> um like that's like so for me I'm just like ugh. And then um also Brad also brought up Juggernaut and the the cord up the ass. Oh, yeah. Like, I think that that's pretty tasteless. To me, I like, it just goes back to talking about the, the Happy Time Murders trailer. Like, I, like, you know, I don't like, like, gross out stuff. I just, you know, I, like, to me, it has to be, there has to be another level. I, I, I like mm-hmm. jokes that are a little bit more sophisticated. I'm a sophisticated <laughs> comedy fan. Yeah. I like to be told about jizz. I don't want to see it. 
<laughs> so I don't know. I I just I I thought some of the jokes were just ugly. Yeah. Okay, Brad. Yeah, I don't know if I have a necessarily a specific ugly moment in the film. Uh, you know, because even the things you might quantify as ugly I feel in tone with the movie mm-hmm. for the most part, whether they're funny or they're not. Um, I think the fact that um, Baccarin is killed up front and dispatched from the movie for the majority of the movie or that that relationship is tidied up into his motivation, I think is a little ugly. So I guess that's what I'd pick. Yeah. All right. Um, for ugly, my ugly is uh, the, f- the idea that Josh Brolin is trying to kill a kid. Um, like it, I don't know for whatever reason. Like the second time I was watching it, when he breaks in to that prison and he's got that huge like future gun that's made up of know, a Vector or M4, or, like it's made up of all these different guns, and it's got like two scopes on it. It's got a a fifty cal barrel tip on it. And it's got like a it's this huge crazy gun that shoots out plasma bullets and all kind of other shit. And like he goes up the stairs on the walkway, and um, Russell's right there, and he's like. He has him dead bang, and he pulls the trigger, and, and Deadpool jumps in front of him and, like, moves the machine gun out the way. And so I was just thinking, like, if Deadpool hadn't stopped him right there, he would have shot that kid in the face with a freaking machine gun. Right. And, like, just that, that I, and I know his motivation in the movie is because um, Russell's going to grow up, and he's going to go down a dark path because of the headmaster at the school that was abusing him. And he's going to end up uh, coming after Cable. And then by doing so, he's going to kill his family. And so that's C- Cable's motivation to go back. But even with that motivation, like, I just, there was some, there's just something ugly about that. Like, he's so mad. And I'm not saying, I'm not judging him for it. I'm not saying that that character is not, is or isn't justified or whatever. But there, there's, even if he is right and doing, there's just something ugly about that idea that, I don't know why that stuck out to me this time when I was watching it, but I was like, damn, like that's, that's fucking hard. There was a post credit scene that they cut from the film. They filmed it and they showed it to one test audience where uh, he's going back in time and he goes back in time to a German nursery and there's little baby Hitler oh, wow. and he kills baby. Oh Hitler. my God. <laughs> and that was going to be the last post credit scene. But based on how that audience reacted to it, they're like, mm, let's not have that. Yeah. That's- <laughs> So I don't know, like just that. I mean, again, like I mean, just that idea that I mean, that's Hitler. You know, it's gonna grow, and he's gonna fucking do some. He's probably gonna be the most despicable person that ever put two feet on this planet. But then, like the idea of going back and murdering a baby, like even if it's justifiable that you save like millions of people, the idea of that infant dying to me is just that's crazy. It's you should crazy. just adopt that baby. Yeah, and treat him nicer. Oh, yeah. I'd be so disappointed if I adopted and raised baby Hitler, and then he still turned out to be the biggest asshole. Oh, uh, that'd be bad parenting, Lisa. Uh. <laughs> um, so, ladies and gentlemen, let us know what you thought of Deadpool 2, if you've in fact seen it, or if we've, uh, hopefully we haven't talked to you out of not uh, watching it. Um, go see it. Your mileage may vary. Uh, you can hit us up on social media at ItModcast on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Uh, Brian, what are you looking forward to this weekend? Solo? Solo. Um, yeah, and checking out Evil Genius. Um, oh, yeah. So that we can talk about that at yeah, some yeah, point. Yeah, yeah. And um, also still uh, got Manhunt on the docket. Why? Because <laughs> you said you wanted me to see it. Oh, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> Watch Cargo first. I'd rather right. talk to you about that than Manhunt. Jesus. <laughs> All right. Uh, why, oh, you can follow that guy at the Turtle Dork on Twitter, at the Turtle Dork one on Instagram, and at Brian William Young on Facebook. Wife Dork. Yes. What are you doing this week? Oh, well, I am also going to be seeing um, Solo, oh. um, but I've been really enjoying the uh, stand-up on Netflix. Um, I've already told you about John Mulaney and and Moshe Kasher, and, and um, I watched Ali Wong's new special, uh, Something Wife. I forget what it's called. I should have Googled it. But um, Tig Notaro... One of my all-time faves is coming out with a new special this month, so I'm super looking forward to that. All right. Uh, and you can follow her at Bake Dork on Twitter, also at Sidewalk Siren on Twitter and Instagram and Letterboxd. Thank you. Brad Gullick's in his mouth, Dork. What are you doing this week? 
Uh, I'm, I mean, I'm also looking forward to Solo. The closer we get to that movie, the more excited I find yeah, myself. It's interesting. I, yeah. uh, I was really not anticipating that enthusiasm. But we also have an interview coming up on this Wednesday with Isa Lopez, the yeah. director of Tigers Are Not Afraid. So I'm really looking forward to getting that out there into yes. the world. Yes. Uh, you can follow that guy at Mouth Dork on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, Letterboxd, and Untapped. And I'm Darren Smith, the Disco Dork. I'm looking forward to um, Cal Rizian on Thursday <laughs> um, and uh, that's pretty much it um, I don't know I guess I want to go back and start rewatching some older movies since I don't see anything new on uh, Amazon or Netflix or even in the movie theater that's the only thing that's coming out is uh, Solo this week it's mm-hmm. the only thing that anybody cares about yeah. First Reformed is coming to the theater okay, I would, so, again I'd recommend seeing so, that so yeah I have to see that uh, this weekend too um, that's going to do it for us um, Disco Dork on all social medias. Uh, thank you all for listening. Enjoy the rest of your week. Be on the lookout for that. Oh, we got a fistful of scoundrels coming out yeah. uh, in honor of Solo. So uh, start getting your fistfuls ready. I wanted to do a fistful of Nerf Herders, but none of you guys would do it. <laughs> oh, well, I only Babe, got... pay, babe is, was a, a herder. Sheep herder, though. Yeah, oh. no, Nerf. We're only looking for Nerf herders. Oh, my Nerf herder fistful would have been short. <laughs> Uh, but we got a fistful of scoundrels, so that's something that you all could do too. Put it together and get ready for that episode on Friday. That's going to do it for us. Thank you all for listening. Enjoy the rest of your week, and until next time. <laughs>